Good morning, everybody. Oh, it was great. Thank you. Yeah. It's great to be with all of you. I am Jeremy Drake, one of the pastors here, and it is a blessing to not just be with all of you here, but to know that there are hundreds of people uh, at the East York campus, and we welcome all of them, and even online. You know, we have individuals and families in Ohio, Florida, uh, LA, Marathon, New York, you, you name it. They're all over the country, and even in Asia, Africa, and Europe, we have an international audience, if you will, but we're not an audience, are we? We're a family, and that's why we are having a series on these life stages that we started at Mother's Day and then picked back up last week with Father's Day and are going to continue for the next couple of weeks. We're going to talk about those family ideas of Scripture that we need to cover in these life stages And I am grateful for today's message. Uh, Anyone a fan of Star Trek The Next Generation? You remember that show? It's a classic now. It's a classic now, believe it or not. It's old. But in one of the episodes, Captain Picard has a strange experience among many. They're flying through space. They see a probe. And all of a sudden, he falls unconscious. And while he's asleep for a few minutes, he lives an entire lifetime as a member of a different alien species to experience what had happened long in the past because they were gone. And then he wakes up, and it's only a few minutes have gone by, but it changes him forever. But it always struck me that he is a young father who's married. Then you see him progress through being an older father and a grandfather and then witnessing the end of his life. And they completely skipped his youth, his young adulthood. They just left it out. And I think we do that a lot. I think we skip over and get past and fast forward through the early stages of life, the first 20 or 30 years, and I think we do a disservice to ourselves. Here's a question for everyone. Are you ready? Think. Have you ever been single in your life? Raise your hand. You got it. Okay, I shouldn't say that that was much better than the eight o'clock group. They had to think, but it was earlier. It was earlier. It's all of us. We all have been or are single. Everyone has experienced singleness. So I'm going to talk about four stages of singleness in the message today. And the first one is called single for now. So what do we mean by this? Single for now. I don't just mean adolescents. I don't mean the children. They're just kids. They should be single at eight, right? And that's always a fun joke to, hey, you know, go up to an eight-year-old and ask them about their girlfriend or boyfriend, and they get all red in the face. But we're talking about older adolescents, teenagers, early adulthood, the single for now. There's an expectation that marriage and those relationships are in the future, but in the moment, They're single. And so we're going to use a lot of the passages today, not one single one, but I'm going to start with Psalm 119, uh, verses 9 through 11. Wisdom for us today. Wisdom for us. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you you. So many of us have memorized that last sentence. I've hidden God's word in my heart that I might not sin against him, right? And that's wisdom for all of us. But here it's applied specifically to a young person. And that idea of purity or a path of purity actually could be translated this way. How can a young person sweep clean the path in front of them so that there are no barriers in their life. That's actually how the Hebrew text there reads. And I think it's really appropriate for us because I think we know that our culture's view of adolescence and early adulthood is broken. True? Yeah. Our culture's view of adolescence and early adulthood is broken, and we should not follow the crowd Please don't. When we are young, we have dreams and aspirations and lots of potential energy. I wish I still had some of my potential energy. I burned it off. But, you know, we have things that we want to do and we want to accomplish and the energy to do them. But there are lies in this world. The world, the flesh, and the devil are trying their best 
to not give us a clear path, but instead heap garbage and junk along the way to put potholes and pit holes in our path. So I want to talk for a few minutes about how to live in light of God's truth and in his word. And I know that for those of us, for those of you who are single for now, you may become married someday. So how you clear the path and cleanse it and purify it sets you up for success down the road. I hope that you can live by the words of the Lord. First, God designed you to marry one person and for that person to be your only sexual partner until one of you dies. That is a truth. And that means you need to be careful in how you live and the behaviors you engage in and the relationships you have so that you keep that path clear. I love the words of Song of Solomon. There's a great phrase that's repeated three different times. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Chapter two, chapter three, and chapter eight, repeated verbatim each time. There is potentially, for those who are single for now, for most, a relationship of marriage in the future. And we are instructed by God not to put the cart before the horse emotionally. And we do that emotionally by often doing it physically and getting love awakened before it's time. God gave the gift of physical intimacy to us, and so we must never forget that it's his blessing, and because it's his blessing, it's under his rules. The world has turned 180 and run in the opposite direction and messed it completely up and set a horrible example. Hookup culture is not godly, and it's not healthy. Body count is not something to be celebrated unless it's zero or one. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. You can ask someone younger than you and they will explain what that means. There has been a myth perpetuated that the divorce rates are pretty much the same for everyone. 50% of divorces, of marriages end in divorce and it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, it's all the same for everyone. And actually those statistics are false. They are not correct. For Christ followers who profess belief in Christ, in God's word, and are committed to regular church involvement and celebrating God's word as true and authoritative, divorce rates are less than 25%, not like the rest of the culture. And for those of you who have heard that you should test drive a relationship before you enter into a marriage covenant, don't do it. Because... The statistics are horrible on that. For every partner an individual has before they're married, they increase the odds of divorce by 4% and it compounds each time. It's not all the same. And I know that this is something that the world and the culture pushes at us. But if you're single for now, that's not how you're to live. Job came to a decision early on in his life, and he talks about it in uh, chapter 31, verse 1. Job makes this covenant. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully on a young woman. My children have heard me say upon occasion, and I've taught this to the youth at times, treat everyone else as if they're someone else's husband or wife until they might become yours. That works for all of us, by the way, right? Treat everyone else as someone else's husband or wife because they're not yours until they are. And so that's how we should honor God by our relationship status of singleness before him. Now, I know I'm focusing on the, you know, future marriage and those ideas of purity. And I know for some of you, you're going, I, I haven't actually lived that in my life. I, that's not present reality. I'm not gonna say that's okay but I'm gonna say there's grace and forgiveness and potential for change for all of us right now, right? We can get things wrong, I do on a daily basis. That's not my point. My point is there's a principle, live by the principle. If you haven't lived by it, change so that you can. There's a lot more to being single for now than just sexual purity. First Timothy 4.12, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, 
and impurity. Just because you are a teenager or a 20-something does not mean you don't have something to focus on. You do. Look at Jesus' early life, Luke 2, 52. And Jesus grew. Do we think about that sometimes? Jesus himself grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man as a young adult. Until he started his ministry at age 30, he lived a normal human life and followed God's word and grew in wisdom and stature. So this is something I need for us to focus on, something to do now. For the single for now, early adulthood should be focused on becoming like Christ, seeking his will and honoring others. Amen? That's what young adulthood, that's what all adulthood should be focused on. I firmly believe that young believers, younger followers of Christ can honor Christ and we can do it at any age. We don't need to wait till we arrive at a certain point in time in a certain relationship to do that. Paul gave Titus and the church on the island of Crete this advice, Titus 2, 1 through 8. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith and love and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children and to be self-controlled and pure and to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled and everything set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. The world expects immaturity of the young. God does not. It. The world does not expect integrity, seriousness, or sound speech. The world does not teach what is good. It does not teach self-control. It does not teach temperance, respect, purity. God teaches all those things with the expectation that you are able to do it if you walk in step with him. VBS starts tonight. We've already celebrated that. I can't wait. Children's ministry is the most important ministry in the church, and I love what VBS represents. But what I like about it the most is that the entire church is involved, right? The whole church is involved. That includes young adults who many are single for now, and they're right involved. They're involved not just in VBS, but in our worship teams, tech teams, guest services, missions. Our single for now adults are fully involved and integrated in the life of the church. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Because the church should be an extended family, right? The church should be an extended family of spiritual fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters who protect, disciple, and encourage. If you're a young adult right now, if you're single for now, is it helpful to know that you have a church that wants to see you thrive in your discipleship, that wants to encourage you in your following of Christ, and wants to protect you by being there for you when life gets hard and when the world tells you to do things counter than what God would tell you to do. Isn't that an encouragement? And that's what we're supposed to be, church. For those who are single for now, for those of us who are not, they are not supposed to be off on a distance. They're supposed to be integrated into our families. And we're supposed to care for them. I know of a young man getting ready for college, just graduating high school, and he was going to go to Bible college, and he wanted to be a pastor. And his church had recognized the gift and the calling, and were launching him to do so. But he had a girlfriend who was not going to be going with him and didn't want to go into the ministry, and it was known. And there was an older brother in Christ who went up to the young man on a Sunday afternoon and said, hey, walk around the block with me. I'd like to talk with you. And he did, respectfully listening to his words. And he said, 
I think I know where you're headed and I'm so proud of you. We are praying for you, but I have a question. Are you choosing to have a relationship with someone who is not headed in the same direction? Not that she's not a believer, but you have a call before God and it doesn't seem like she does. Well, he really didn't know how to answer, but the words couldn't help but go around in his mind. And so before he left for school, he actually broke up with the young lady at the church and he went to Bible college. And when he was there, he met a young woman who was also there studying and she wanted to be a pastor's wife. And they had got married and they got 60 years of wonderful church ministry. And I'm so grateful for that gentleman who went up to that young man and gave him wisdom because that young man married my grandmother. And that is a legacy of faith. But you know what? It took someone being involved. Someone who wasn't single coming to someone single for now and giving them wisdom to protect them and encourage them. So that's the first group, single for now. There's another group, and it's an extension of that. It's the single long-term. It's a difficult thing to know if singleness might be a permanent part of your life. Um, some people, are some people going to live a little bit longer single before they get married? Yes. Are some people going to live their whole lives and not get married? Yes. Those are realities. We experience them. We know them. We know that that is a reality. And the scriptures do too. And therefore, I want to make a strong statement about those who are single long term. Okay? Single adults are neither incomplete nor less mature than married adults. Some of the le least mature people I know are actually married. <laughs> My wife knows that every single day. <laughs> so, but if you are single long term, if you're single for now, if you're a young adult in the church and you're single, you are not second class or less than or incapable of ministry and service like the married folks. Did the rest of the church hear that too? Amen. It's true. Look at the life of Joseph, the one of the coat of many colors, right? Now, he did get married and have kids later in life. But when he was a young man and single, he was sold into slavery and represented himself so well that Potiphar raised him up to be second in his household next to him and put everything in charge, in Joseph's charge. We know that Joseph had to flee from Potiphar's wife when she came after him, and he ended up being in prison for a period of time. But you know what happened again to Joseph? Pharaoh found out about him and put him in charge of Egypt, second command, vice president, if you will. The scriptures seem to say that this was all while Joseph was a single man. We need to have the same kind of respect for our single adults in the church. And so this is something we can learn from Joseph and others. The ability of a single adult to focus on ministry and service within the body of Christ cannot be overlooked. Amen? Can't be overlooked. Throughout the years here at COD and in many churches, single adults have served, led ministries, and been called into missions and the pastorate. We've had a single pastor here at this church. If you remember, Pastor Scott Carter, right? We know that marriage brings its own blessings and certain areas of maturity, but they are not exclusive to married people. Single adults can have that too, and sometimes more so. I want to read two passages from Scripture, one from Jesus and the other from the Apostle Paul. Notably, two single men who changed the world, right? And the Apostle Paul would not want to be included with Christ because he was humble and would not want in any way to be associated with the grandeur of who Jesus is, but they both were single men. Matthew 19, we'll start there. Words of Christ. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who are born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept this. If you spend time reading the words of Christ in the Gospels, you will very quickly see that Jesus spoke bluntly and many times in ways that made people uncomfortable. 
I love it. Because he gets at the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter here is he's saying, for those who are called to live a single life for my kingdom and honor me for all their days and serve and work, that is a blessing. It may be difficult. Jesus understood difficulty. And he knew what he left behind and what he did not take on for himself. But he sought God. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 35 says similar things. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Now, we have to understand how countercultural this was then and now, Right? In that culture, for a young woman to not be married, she never achieved the status of influence of any kind that she deserved. And for young men, it was very similar. And Jesus uses that difficult word and passage of eunuchs to get their attention, but also to draw their attention back to a prophecy from Scripture. Isaiah 56, 4 and 5. For this is what the Lord says, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. I know that at times, those of you who are single and maybe single long term, You can struggle with your identity in life and in the church. You can struggle with a sense of purpose. And I know that that struggle is real. I'm not going to overlook that or deny it today. That's not the point of this. But God makes a special promise that there is a blessing and a reward, a treasure in heaven that is so special It's better than being called a son and a daughter of God. And I can't imagine what would be better than that. And I know that the calling is hard and difficult. But the fruit for the kingdom is amazing. John Piper summarizes this well in his book, Momentary Marriage. God promises those who remain single in Christ blessings that are better than the blessings of marriage and children. And he calls you to display by the Christ-exalting devotion of your singleness the truths about Christ and his kingdom that shine more clearly through singleness than through marriage and child-rearing. And I'm not just throwing platitudes and a Pollyanna attitude about singleness here, but I just want to acknowledge the sacrifice and the difficulty of long-term singleness. If it's aimed at God and to serve his kingdom, there is blessing and a blessing that's beyond description. But there's also a truth for the single long-term that the church needs to hear um, and the single individual also needs to learn. And hopefully this is true. Singleness does not equal aloneness. To be single does not equal being alone. Loneliness should not happen in the church. As a church seeking life change in Jesus, one that emphasizes experience and community in its mission and vision with a personal value of community, we cannot allow ourselves to fall into any type of isolation, nor can we allow those single for now adults to be isolated from us. Our calling is to include them in a deep and intimate way Romans 12.10 and Hebrews 10.23 through 25. Romans 12.10, be devoted to one another in love. What would it look like, church, if we opened up our families and our homes and we were so devoted to the single adults in our midst that they felt like they were a part of our family and they were never alone or isolated? That's devotion. 
Hebrews 10, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approach. That's the challenge that God's word places before us as a congregation If you are single in this church, you are not second class. You are fully a part of the body of Christ, and you should find family here. And families, our spiritual duty is to include and not neglect our brothers and sisters who have not been given a marriage partner in life, at least up to this point. We are to be a family together. Now, the next group need to move on. The next group is those who find themselves single again. And I know there are some of you here that that's who you are. You are single again. You've experienced marriage, and for whatever reason, you are not married today. And whether that's through the disillusion of a marriage in divorce or the loss of a spouse due to death, that's who you are today. God's word recognizes that those who are married might return to a state of singleness through divorce or the loss of a spouse. I just want to say this. God sees you. God knows. He knows the struggles and he knows the difficulties. And Jesus is there to walk with you. And he's also given you the church. 1 Corinthians 7 and Matthew 5 provide for us the structure of understanding what it means to be single again. 1 Corinthians 7, no, to the unmarried and the widows, I say it's good for them to stay unmarried as I do, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. You might have thought that verse was about the young, but it's not. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is. And I think that I too have the spirit of God. And then Jesus' strong words in Matthew chapter 5. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. For the widowed, singleness is as viable an option as remarriage. And the word of God says you're open to pursue whichever of those God calls you to. The area where God is strong is in the area of remarriage after divorce. And God's standards of marriage are high, and they should be. He created it. And I have had the great experience of officiating at weddings for those in their 70s and 80s who are getting married again, and it's been a blessing. A couple years ago, a man and woman, 83 and 85, came to me and said, the Lord's brought each other into our lives. Would you do our wedding? It was wonderful, wonderful. I've also done some weddings for people who have been divorced and have gone through the pain of that. And I was privileged to do so. But what we did is we went to the scriptures and we went to God's word and we walked through the process of discerning whether or not there was freedom to do so. And we allowed God to set the course forward as we all should do. I think this is the key. For those who are single again, for those who find themselves single again, they are held to the same standards of purity and righteousness as those who are young and single. The single for now, the single long-term, and the single again, they're all single in the eyes of Christ, and they're all his servants. And so we're supposed to live in the same way. Now, I want to read James 
chapter 1, verse 27, because there's a responsibility in the church here that we can't overlook. Religion that God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. We recognize that in our church family, there are those who are single again. And God actually gives us a special responsibility to them, that we're to care for them, and that's good, correct religion to do. So for the single again, here's the church's responsibility. The church is responsible for those who have lost a spouse in these ways, through encouragement, support, and even provision, right? In Timothy, uh, there is some word about the family, that families are supposed to care for their parents and grandparents, and that is a spiritual obligation. But we know in the church, there are those who don't have a family, and they find themselves single again. And we are called to be their caregivers and their support. Is that something we do as a church? Are we mindful of that? Again, do we open our homes to the single again? Because they are our family and they need us. So single for now, single long-term and single again. Kind of covers almost everyone at some point. But here's the fourth category and it does cover us all. The fourth group are the single forever. Think about that. Single forever. What, where are we headed with this? Well, let's read Luke 20, 34 to 36. Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die for they are like the angels. They are God's children since they are children of the resurrection. That's right. We will all be single forever. I don't know if you ever thought about that before, right? In the age to come, no one will be married. We will all be single. Now, some of you right now are reaching down and grabbing your husband or your wife's hand and clinging to it real hard. Why not? God has given you to each other in this life for blessing, right? And for honor and for raising families and children to follow Christ. But that's this temporary earthly existence in heaven. Our destiny, and listen to this, our destiny is to be in perfect relationship with God and each other. And not to do that as married people, but as single people forever. So let's begin to live that reality now, whether married or single. And I don't mean that we should all end all of our marriages and just be single for the rest of our lives. Some of you are worried that that's where I might be headed with that. No. But that's the grand picture of human relationship to God and each other. We are designed to be brothers and sisters, children of God as one generation alone for eternity, looking to God. And so that should influence how we live now. If you are single for now, you will be single forever. So honor God in your singleness. If you are single long term, You're going to be single forever, so honor God in your singleness. If you're single again, you're going to be single forever in heaven, so honor God with your singleness. And if you're married, and Pastor Bob in two weeks and three weeks is going to have a little series about marriage, honor God anyway, because we're all single together in eternity, and that's what God is calling us to do. If you are single You have a high calling from God to honor him with your life. And so I have a couple of wrap-up questions here for us. Just self-reflective, okay? Do any of us, but here specifically, do any of us need to repent 
of any attitudes, choices, or actions that have not matched up to the single life God has called you to? If you are currently single, we have laid out God's standards. And is there anything that you have thought or acted or behaviored in where you go, you know, I'm just not living the way God has prescribed. It's not okay, but it can be dealt with. Because the love and mercy of God wants to overshadow you and help you follow him. So that's a personal question. Ask yourself. Another question. Do you need to relinquish control of your singleness to God so that you can live with contentment and joy? Does currently being single give you bitterness? Now, if it's bitterness because you're alone and isolated because the church has not been the church, then shame on us. But have you learned contentment in where you are today, knowing that tomorrow is in God's hands and he loves you? Third, church, has our attitude or treatment of the singles in our congregation matched the high calling of God to be devoted to one another? and to live as spiritual brothers and sisters? Has it? We believe in community. We believe that people need people. We need each other, and the single brothers and sisters need us. So what is the Lord going to tell you today and tomorrow about how you can bring one or two of the single adults in our church into your community, your small group, your family, so that we can be what God intends. Singleness is the goal of eternity because the goal of eternity is focused on God. And for now, that is still the attitude that we can have in our hearts, focused on God and loving each other well in the family of God. Those questions only you can answer as the Lord leads you. But if you need help along the way, come and talk to any of us in leadership other brothers and sisters you respect, and let's live out the integrity of Christ in our families, including those who find themselves single. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning, for your goodness, and I know that you have provided all resources for us, and you call each of us to a different path, but you are the same God over all, and your love and your mercy overshadows us and overwhelms us even when life is hard. I pray for our church family that you would keep us pure and holy in your sight. I pray that you would help us to be the community of faith so that no one is alone. I pray that you would encourage us to find joy in whatever status we have. And I pray that you would see your kingdom flourish in our midst as we serve and follow you. We thank you for tonight and for VBS. Just out, pour, pour out your spirit upon the children, Lord, and thank you for those who serve. We praise you in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Church of the Open Door Sermons Podcast. Church of the Open Door is based out of York, Pennsylvania, and we exist to help everyone discover life changed through Jesus. For more information about Church of the Open Door or for locations and service times, be sure to visit us at codyork.org. Thanks again so much for listening.